Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul. Worship His holy name. Sing like never before, oh my soul. I worship Your holy name. The sun. It's time to sing your song again. Whatever may pass and whatever lies before me, let me be singing when the evening comes. So bless the Lord, oh my soul.
Jesus, we're waiting on your love. We want your spirit in this place. Jesus, come pray through. We want confidence in this room. Your joy to break our Lord. We need your love in this house. Jesus, run through this place. Oh, oh. We believe, Jesus, that this is a house of worship. We believe this is a place that we can come and we can gather. Even those of us who know you well and those of us who are far from you, that we can come under one roof and say that we want your wonder to break out in this place. That we want your love to break out in this place. That we want your hope to break out in this place, Lord Jesus. And so, Lord, we come and we worship tonight in spirit and truth. We come and worship tonight because we believe that you are powerful, and you are almighty, and you love us and you saved us. And you continue to bring us from glory to glory. In your name, amen.
the victor has won And heaven has come And now you're taking us high Come on, scream it out!
be seated. No, you know what? Stay up the whole, whole message. I'd rather have you stand the whole time. I'm just kidding. I don't think I get to sit the whole night. So maybe I'll sit down and give this message. I, I, you know, I got to be honest. I was, I was uh, back there when Josh started uh, singing. Before he sang, I exalt thee. You know, we give you this night. We give you our anxiety. We give you uh, our worry. That was not planned. That was just him sort of singing over the room, which was beautiful, wasn't it? It was just sort of like this is, this is what sort of we as a community are sort of singing out. And for some of you that right where you're living, I actually was smiling because I'm like, Josh is singing that for me. He is singing that for me tonight because he, uh, he knows where my heart is. He knows I've got a heavy heart. Um, and, you know, I, I don't know about you, but have it all was for me. Because <laughs> I needed to do this tonight. I needed to go 
You can have it all, Lord, every part of my life. Take this heart and breathe on. This heart that is not yours. I don't know. You know, we're all different places when we walk in here on any particular Saturday or Sunday or or, uh, tonight. And uh, I'm going to talk about the love of God, which is awesome. Um, it really is, and I, I'm, I'm going to preach to me tonight. I, 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 if you want to over listen to what God is saying to me, because you know sometimes you preach and you feel it. Sometimes you preach when you don't feel it, and it's true anyway. It doesn't matter. Well, I feel exactly this, but it is true. The love of God is reckless. It's reckless. So let me pray, and then let me preach. Father God, you speak. Lord, I pray that I would not get in the way of what you want to say to me and to us, about your incredible, overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love that is true, that is constant at all times, no matter what's going on in our lives, no matter what's going on in our church, it doesn't, you are always reckless in your love for us, and we don't deserve it, that's why it's reckless, that's why it's amazing grace. So Lord, I pray that we would just just get a a taste, a little bit of a taste of your reckless love tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. I'll tell you where this uh, series started, um, that we're starting right now tonight, and we're going to go next week and every week back and forth between Troy and uh, Orion. We're going to collaborate just like we did on the James Witness series. This one's called Reckless Love, but it's it's going to be a little bit different. We're not going through a book of the Bible. We're actually going to let each teacher just teach whatever he wants about the reckless love of God. It can be any passage. It can be any story. Uh, they'll all be on the same theme, but they'll all be a little bit different. In fact, um, you know, I'm looking out here tonight. I'm like, wow, last two weeks ago when Cody was here, this place was packed, and I show up, and nobody's here. I get it. I get it. Um, but I'm guessing next week it'll be packed again because Jamie Winship is teaching at Troy next, next week at, at, at midweek. See, I can tell already you're like, I wish he was here tonight. Well, he'll be there next week, all right? Uh, it's so funny. Jamie's coming in uh, with Donna. They're staying at our house Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. They're going back Thursday to shoot a DVD curriculum for us in Kensington. And they specifically said, we're coming in to work. Don't set up any appointments. We can't meet with anybody, and we don't want to speak anywhere. And so I text Danny Cox last night. I go, dude, you know what you're speaking on next week? He goes, I got Jamie speaking. I'm like, what? <laughs> you can't have Jamie speaking. He said, he said yes. So good for that. It's going to be awesome next. Uh, and, and by the way, I'd love to tell you what Jamie's going to talk about, but if you know Jamie, he doesn't even know what he's going to talk about right now. But it will be absolutely fabulous. But I'll tell Oh, yeah, and Ann said, she talked to Donna today, and Donna said, make sure that I tell you no appointments they're while they're here. They're, they're, they're booked the whole time. They're shooting curriculum, I think, four or five hours a day on Tuesday and Wednesday, and then they're out of here. So, okay, so we get them Wednesday night, but that's about it, and then you'll be able to get them on video as a small group uh, later as we get that thing produced. Okay, I'm talking way too long. Um, and as I, as I explain where we're going, we're going to take the offering right now because we uh, are going to sing at the end of the night a couple more songs. And so I hope you came ready to give. Many of you give online. God bless you. Thank you. If you're new to Kensington, you can let this pass if you want. But ushers, I'm going to keep talking, and you can start passing the pouch. All right? Um, I got to be honest. I was uh, out visiting Cody and Jenna, what, a month ago? Ann and I were out there in California, and we went to their church. And on Sunday night, they had a service. And they did a song I'd never heard before. And I found out, I think it might be the first time they'd ever done this song. Now it's on YouTube and you can find it. We're going to do it to close the night. But when I heard these words, I actually pulled my phone out. I could show you the video. And I videoed it uh, because I was like, oh my gosh, this song is the mission of Kensington. It's like, it, it captures why we exist, why we try to, I'll, I'll read you the words you're going you're gonna, to uh, sing later. But the chorus is this, and, and we did it a couple weeks ago, just impromptu, we didn't rehearse it, Val just started singing it, and we just started following her, and it, it, it ended up pretty good. Tonight, we've actually rehearsed it, but it goes like this, oh, the, I'll show you, oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. How many have heard this song? It's beautiful, it really is, and you're going you're gonna to be able to experience that later tonight, we're going to end the night with it, but it's like... You know, I was sitting in the back of this auditorium, and Ann and I were looking at it. I was like, listen to those words, overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. There's the title of our series, obviously. I was like, oh, my gosh. That could be a great series. And then he says, oh, it chases me down. What? God, his love, 
fights till I'm found, leaves the 99. When I heard that lyric in the back of the room, I said, did, did she just say leaves the 99? That's Luke 15. That's our mission statement, to see every one, right? The 99 found, go after the one. I go, there it is. To see everyone what? Anybody know our mission statement? To see everyone transformed, mobilized by Jesus. And this is, how does God go after the one? Because of his overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love. Now, look at this, this bridge that we're going to sing later. The bridge goes on to say this. Pop that up. I think we got it, yeah? Look at this. I love this. There's no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up coming after me. I got to be honest. I was in the back of the auditorium. I'd never heard this. I'm like, oh, that is so well said. You know, you're in the darkness. There's no shadow. God's going to break into your darkness with light. There's no mountain he won't climb up coming after me. Look at it. There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down coming after me. You get to sing that later. But I thought, oh my gosh, let's do a series for the summer. It's just going to take us right into the fall and just spend every week looking at the amazing, overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. Now, here's the thing. I got to be real honest. You know the way I'm wired. It isn't just that God loves us so much and we just soak in that, although sometimes you need to soak in it. Maybe tonight's a night for you to soak in it. But here's what I think happens. When you and I really begin to understand the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God, it does two things. It transforms us. We can no longer be who we used to be. It changes us. If you're not even a follower of Christ tonight, and you begin to understand how much God, your creator, actually really, really loves you, and I'm just going to walk you through a psalm that I hope will bring that to light. When you understand how much he loves you, it transforms you. You can't run away from that. You run toward it. And if you run away, God's going to chase you anyway. He will leave the 99 to chase you. And then once he gets you, and many of you know this because we've, we've been overwhelmed by the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God, what happens? Then he mobilizes us to do what? Take that love to the world. I mean, it's just like, it's, it's our mission statement that comes out of, oh my gosh, when I understand God's reckless love, it changes me so much that I go on mission. You get it? So it isn't I just soak in it, although sometimes, you know, like tonight, I would love to just soak a little bit. Because sometimes you just need to be, you know, taken care of. And then as he transforms you and he just breathes new life into you, he always does this. He sends us out on mission to take this reckless love where? To people that don't even know what it is. In your family, in your neighborhood, in your school, maybe even in your church, right? So that's sort of the, the bottom line of where we're, where we're going. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to read a psalm tonight. Psalm 103, all right? And I told you on Sunday, if you were here, read the whole psalm. I'm going to teach the whole thing. Well, I was wrong. As I started studying, I'm like, there's no way I'm getting through 22 verses in two and a half hours that they gave me tonight. So, <laughs> no, I, I, I'm at 23 minutes left to go, okay? So there's no way I'd cover 22 verses, so I thought I can cover 12. And that in itself is going to be hard. But you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to say, let's read that together, all 12 verses, before I sort of break them down. And I'm going to do the same thing we did in the Witness series. When the Word of God is read, we stand almost at attention, right? Because we revere the Word of God. So go ahead and stand up with me. It'll come up here on the screen. I'll lead you. And let's read what David, King David, wrote in Psalm 103. It goes like this. Bless the Lord, O my soul. And all that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your iniquity, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy, who satisfies you with good so that your youth is renewed like the eagle's. The Lord works righteousness and justice for all who are oppressed. He made known his ways to Moses, his acts to the people of Israel. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. He will not always chide, nor will he keep his anger forever. He does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his steadfast love toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. Amen. You may be seated. Now, if, if you're like me and you're reading that, you're like, dude, 
I haven't read that in a long time. It's like loaded with reckless love of God, isn't it? So let's, again, all I'm going to do is just go verse by verse, break this thing down. He starts out, and he says this actually twice. He says, bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that, with it, all that is within me, bless his holy name. By the way, I'm reading from the ESV. So he says, bless the Lord. That's why we started tonight with Josh out here all by himself singing the song Matt Redman wrote, I think, five or six years ago. Bless the Lord, O my soul. Isn't it a beautiful song? Here's the, here's the funny thing. Some of you are old enough like me, and Ann's sitting right here. She might remember this. But there was a song written from Psalm 103 that we sang in church growing up that was nowhere near as good as Matt Redmond's. Bless the Lord. Ours was, bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his whole. Anybody know what I'm talking about? You do. You want, you want to sing it? Bless the Lord. Oh. It always modulated, you know, every time. Like, it'd be, bless the Lord. And that guy would be up there, Shana. Anybody remember that? How bad is that? I mean, in the, in the day, it was good. 25 years from now, we're going to look back and bless the Lord. and think, oh, that's terrible, right? But in the moment, it was awesome. I can remember as a kid, you know, looking at parents and people around us just singing that out of the top of our own. But I got to tell you something, and maybe Ann remembers this. When I was in seminary, 1982, how many were alive then? <laughs> Actually, who cares? How many weren't alive in 82? <laughs> yeah. I'm glad you're here, because you're going to keep this church going when we're done, all right? I'm glad you're here if you were born in 90 and 2000. Thank God you're here. But uh, so I'm in seminary in 82. Ann and I have been married two years. Yeah, two years. And the, the president of my seminary is a guy named Ron, Dr. Ron Jensen. We called him Dr. J, because we would play pickup basketball in California. I was in Southern California with Dr. J all the time. I love this guy. And he was uh, a worship leader as well. He was a pastor for like 20-some years before he uh, became a, a prophet seminary, and then he ended up being the, the president. And so he had a really good voice, and he, would, he, he often sometimes would lead worship at our chapel services, which were several times a week. And he would sing that song. That literally, bless the Lord, oh, my soul. And Ron had a great voice, didn't he, honey? And, and I'll never forget him telling us one time in class, isn't it amazing the things you remember? 82, what's that, 35 years ago? I'll never forget him saying, he goes, you know, sometimes I walk in the shower in the morning and I sing Psalm 103 because if you look at it in the original Hebrew, it's an imperative assertive. Bless the Lord is a command. Assertive means strong command. It isn't, hey, if you feel like it, bless the Lord, oh, my soul, and all that is within me. No, he says what David is saying is sometimes you don't want to. Sometimes you don't feel like blessing the Lord. And you know what you do? He says you command your soul, all that's within me, bless the holy, holy, his holy name. And I, I can remember Ron saying, there are times I'm in the shower going, bless the Lord, come on, soul, bless the Lord, oh, my soul, come on, soul, bless the Lord. He says, I just, I just... I just imperative command my soul to bless the Lord, whether I feel like it or not. And I'll never forget him saying that because I thought, oh, that's not going to happen in the Christian walk. That's 90% of the Christian walk, isn't it? Sometimes it's, it's, it's marriage gets hard, the Christian walk gets hard. What do you have to do? Sometimes you just have to command yourself to do what David said. And he said it twice, bless the Lord on my soul. Bless the Lord on my soul. And I didn't go to verse 19, 20, 21, 22. He says it five, five more times in the psalm. It's like a theme, like sometimes you just have to command yourself to bless the Lord. And not with some of your heart, what? All. And what do you bless? His holy, set apart, hagias, name above all names, name. You're not blessing a person. You are blessing the God of the universe. And if you don't feel like it, sometimes you just get up and you do it. There are times when we end a service, like we're going to do tonight, and we're, we're going to invite you to stand up. Now, we're not making you stand up. We are inviting you to what? Bless the Lord, oh, my soul, and with all within me, get bless his holy name. You may not feel like doing it. You may want to sit there. That's, that's cool. But sometimes it's like, I just got to stand up and sing whether I feel like it or not. I've said here many times, sometimes we sing words we believe. Sometimes we sing the words until we believe. And sometimes it's like, why do we sing the same thing over and over? You ever gone to a rock concert? That's what you do at a rock concert. Nah, 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 nah. We do it 28 times. Nobody's saying that's weird. It's like, no, sometimes you just have to bring your soul to where your body and your, your heart is. Am I making any sense? And so I think that's where David's starting. He's saying, man, sometimes you have to choose to worship God even when you don't feel like it and your body will follow your soul. You know what I'm saying? It's the same thing in marriage. Sometimes I don't feel like I'm in love with Anne. 
guess what? I do acts of love, hoping my body will catch up. <laughs> right? I'm not kidding. It's the same thing. I could get real specific here about other parts of our marriage, hoping your body... Anyway, that's what I'm talking about. It's just like you sometimes have to do the right thing whether you feel like it or not. And I, and I hate to say this. Most of the time when we decide to ascribe worth to God, which is what the definition of worship is, we often feel like it. But sometimes we don't. Some of you walked in here tonight and you're really, really struggling. Or you're carrying something like I am. And guess what? God says, I want to meet you right there. He's not saying jump up here. You can't tonight. But he's saying, I'll come down to where you are. Now you come to me. You know, and when we, when we invite you to worship, go for it. Just go for it sometimes. And I, and I got to be honest. You know, I, I wrote this down, and you can write this down if you want. I wrote down a definition of worship that I like. Because he's talking about worship here. Bless the Lord, all my soul. I wrote it down this way. Worship is an extravagant response to a radical grace. And here's what I mean by that. I wrote this down. There is a direct correlation between our appreciation of the radical grace of God and our expression of worship. I didn't put that down. They don't have that on PowerPoint. They're like, where's that one? I didn't give it to them. I added it 10 minutes ago. There's a direct correlation between our appreciation of the radical grace of God and our expression of worship. So here's the thing. When you and I understand what Psalm 103 really says is that we deserve death. We deserve to be thrown into the pit because of our sin, but we aren't because we don't want to forget any of his benefits. We'll get there in a second and look what those are. We realize, oh my gosh, the grace that God has given me is not sort of grace or a little bit of grace. It is radical grace. It is beyond anything. I am a dead man who God has raised to life. I am a sinner who's full of dirt and filth, and God has cleansed me and purified me and said, you can never do this, but I did this for you. That's radical grace, and I didn't earn this. I didn't deserve this. I get that. It isn't just grace. It's like, oh my gosh, that's grace, right? And so when you understand that kind of grace, it's like, oh my gosh, how could I go, Mr. Lord? Oh, my soul. Again, it's like, it's like you respond with an extravagant response. But let me tell you something, because I think this gets really confusing, and I, and I do want to take a couple minutes to talk about worship, because I want us to understand this, not only here at midweek, but also on the weekends, is we think extravagant worship, it may sound like because of the word extravagant, it means big. Sometimes it is. Sometimes it's extravagant, but it's small. And, and intense, but not so loud and big. You know what I'm saying? It's sort of like this. Anybody play golf? All right. <laughs> I've played one round so far this year, all right? There's different clubs in golf, right? The biggest, loudest, hardest, hit the farthest club is what? The driver. And when you hit a driver, it's like, of course, you're, you're going to analyze my swing. I don't get anything moving. Nothing can move. You got 18,000 things. <laughs> You know, but anyway, you're going to go, boom, right? You're going to hit a driver. You're not going to hit a driver like this. Dink. You're going to hit it as far as you can, try to hit that thing, right? That's a driver. But there's also a putter. And it's like, no. It's, now, are both intense? Did you hear that? I like that. <laughs> that means it went in. I want putt. No, both clubs are really valuable. They're both, in a sense, extravagant because one's made to go long. One's made to go short. If you mess them up, it won't work worships the same way. Extravagant worship because of a radical grace means sometimes it's big. Sometimes it's loud. Sometimes you dance and you party and you're happy and there are songs even written that way that are saying, let's go, let's, let's dance, let's sing, let's shout to God. There are other songs that aren't as big and they're just tender, they're putters. But it doesn't mean you're not intense, man. When you putt, it's like, oh my gosh, I am locked in but it's just tender. One of the things I noticed at this church that we were at, out with Cody, that I really found, and I brought back here, and I said, I want to teach this to our people. At this church, which is known in the country as a really uh, worshiping church, we've done several of their songs tonight. So they're like one of the best in the country at worship. It's Bethel, right? When they went to worship in their service, it was really interesting to me that as soon as the band started playing, some people rushed to the stage. They had a little area up here where you could go to the stage, and some did that. But many others were totally worshiping God in freedom. I was really sort of shocked that nobody said, stand up, raise your hand, sing this song. They didn't have to. As soon as they started to take this upward, the room just responded. Here's what I saw. Some people were sitting in their chair praying. 
Some people, I could see they had their phone out and they were reading scripture. There were other people putting their arms around people and praying with them. There were some people putting hands on people and praying. It was just, there was nothing weird. It was just beautiful. And I was like, oh my gosh, some are going big. Some are just very tender. They're allowing God in an extravagant way to respond the way they should in that moment. So I'm going to tell you, when we worship later tonight, it's going to be focused on, guess what? The reckless love of God. And so I'm going to invite you to do whatever you want to do. If you feel like standing, stand. If you feel like God is asking you just to sit and put your hands like this and receive, receive. If for some reason somebody's with you and you guys are going through something and you know what they're going through, go over and pray with them. And then start singing later and you can move forward if you want to move it. You understand what I'm saying? I, I would love to see us become a place that's free in our worship and not feel like everybody has to stand up, everybody has to raise their hand, everybody has to do this. You know what I'm saying? But it's tender, it's, it's driver, it's putter, it's extravagant, sometimes it's bigger. Okay, you understand what I'm saying? So even when we do that on a weekend, we're not always going to say, stand up. But I also will say this. I've been thinking about this a lot, as you can tell. I'd also say this. You know, sometimes we, we debate, Josh and I and others, like, okay, we're going to end the service like on a weekend with this song. Should we say, everybody stand? Or should we say, you can stand or you can sit? And here's, here's my opinion. Sometimes it makes sense to say, go ahead and invite and stand. And other times it makes sense to say, if you need to sit or you want to pray with God, go ahead. And that's sort of the vibe tonight. But I also often feel like this, because some people say, I, I don't think you should offend people by saying stand if they don't want to stand. Well, here's the thing. And maybe it's just my, my little, in my spirit about this, is when I say I'm going to pray, I don't go, hey, and if you don't want to listen to me pray, don't listen and don't pray with me. But I'm going to pray and you can do whatever you want. No, I say, let's pray. And I invite you to join me. Now, you don't have to. But I'm inviting you to join me. So I think sometimes when he says, bless the Lord, oh, my soul, sometimes God is leading me or the worship leaders say, I am sort of, I'm going to ask and invite the, the community to take a step of faith. If you don't really feel it right now, just start singing until you start to believe it. And I'm telling you, if you're anything like me, you've done this many times, and all, all of a sudden it's like, oh, my gosh, my soul is catching up. Because I'm speaking out truth in an extravagant, maybe small, maybe big way, and I'm responding to a radical grace. Now, if you're listening very close, you're going, dude, you've got like nine minutes left. So here we go. Here we go. And Lori, I'm going to skip some stuff, so follow me, all right? So he goes on in verse 2, and he says again, bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all of his benefits. If you have another version that says, forget none of his benefits. So here's what we're going to find out. God has loved us in such a way, and there's at least five benefits we're going to look at in 12 verses that, that he says, you want to know how much I love you? I'll show you. Benefit number one, benefit number two. But here's the thing he says, don't forget these. And I got to tell you, if you're anything like me, and I know you are, we forget. I was going to read you all of Deuteronomy 8, where God says to the nation of Israel, as you go into the promised land that you've been waiting and waiting for, and now you're finally going to go in. You know what he, you know what he instructs them to do as soon as you get in that land? Besides setting up their houses and building their thing and setting up their camp, you know what he says? Do not forget. I'll just paraphrase it for you because I don't have time to read it. There's like 18 verses there. I'll just paraphrase it for you. He says, when you get the good land, when you build your paneled houses and your souls are satisfied, you have land, you have money, you have nice homes, you have food. He says, do not forget the Lord your God. Because here's what I've discovered. In prosperity, we tend to forget where it came from. People that are not in prosperity are always begging God, please, God, come through. But once we get there, we tend to think we got ourselves there. He even says that in the passage. You didn't get this. I did this. And this nice home and this nice car and this family you have and this society you live in with freedom of religion, I did that. Don't you forget my benefits. And I just wanted to say that because he, he says right at the beginning, do not forget. Okay, benefit number one. Verse three, he says, who forgives all your iniquity. What's benefit number one? It's one word, forgiven. Forgiven. We are forgiven. We're forgiven by God. He just starts in Psalm 103. And by the way, a lot of people think in the Old Testament there's no forgiveness from God. This is the Old Testament. This is David. And, and most scholars think David wrote this toward the end of his life. He's sort of reflecting back. Does this guy know sin? Oh, yeah. I hope you and I never know the sin like he knows. He's a sinner. He's a dark sinner. He did things I hope none of us ever do. Adultery, murder, lying, deception. It's unbelievable, his track record of sin. And at the end of his life, as he's writing back, he says, God forgives 
your iniquity. I just want to just remind you, don't forget this, and maybe some of you need to know this for the first time tonight. Whatever you've done, whatever you have done today, yesterday, 10 years ago, or whatever has been done to you, guess what God says to you tonight? You're forgiven. And I know you're going to believe the lie. No, I'm not. I can't be forgiven. I, you don't know what I... Yes, you are forgiven. If David's forgiven, and guys like Manasseh in the Bible who were horrific sinners, if God can forgive them, trust me, you're nowhere close to that kind of sin. And I'm nowhere close to you. So it's like crazy <laughs> to think. He says he forgives all your iniquity. I wrote in my notes. I, I, can, I can still see, even as I was finish these notes up today, I can still see Jesus hanging on the cross, arms out, saying what? Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. That's the heart of God right there. He had every right to never say that, but he says, God, they don't even know what they're doing. You don't know what you're doing. I don't. And he says, you are forgiven of all your iniquity. Verse three. Next benefit, number two, we are healed. Verse three, part B says, who heals all your diseases. Who heals all your diseases. Now, it's interesting. You read this, you study the commentators, you study all these scholars. Some think this is more spiritually than physically. Others think it's physically. I think it's both. He heals our iniquity. Or, or, he forgives our iniquity. And out of that, he also forgives our sin and he forgives our, 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 our illnesses. But let me tell you something. God is the God who heals physical disease. Do you believe that? Yeah, now here's what I mean. Here's what I mean by that. It, we don't know how he's going to do it. He could touch you with, with his hand. He doesn't even have to touch you. He could heal your cancer. He could heal a disease you have. He could give me hair if he wanted to, right? <laughs> I'm not kidding. God could do that. Is, God, is there anything impossible with God? No. So God sometimes heals people that way. That sometimes happens. It's rare, but it's a miracle, and healings like that happen all over the world. I really haven't seen very many of those, but I've read stories, and, and they happen, right? They could happen here. They could happen anywhere. But here's what you got to understand. When I was studying this, I was like, God sort of laid this in my heart, is every time illness, disease is healed, God did it. Sometimes he uses medicine. Sometimes he uses doctors. Seven, eight, ten years ago, I don't know, Ann and I walked through this. I had sciatica so bad because uh, the L4, L5 was crushing on my sciatic nerve. It shut down my leg. I couldn't walk. I took Vicodin, Vicodin, Vicodin. It was unbelievable. I had pain all the time. Some of you remember those days. We were at Lake Orion High School that time at, at our Orion campus. I remember I took so many Vicodin on the weekends because the Lions trainer told me I could take 10 a day, so I did, and it was just unbearable pain. Some of you know sciatica pain. It's unbearable. And so I'd walk off the stage, and my buddy Rob would come up and go, how many did you take today, dude? You were wired. I'm like, you can tell. He goes, yeah, it sort of wires up because I was taking pain meds. And I got to tell you, I bet I had 100 people at Orion and Kensington come up, lay hands on me, and pray that God heal my back. Literally, sometimes in front of the stage, sometimes in the green room because I couldn't even walk out to preach. And they're like, God can heal. And I go, go for it. <laughs> I'm like, here you go, right there. <laughs> you know, don't push too hard, but pray. And they did, and they prayed, and they prayed. And I never once got a physical, physical healing that way. But guess what? I had surgery by a guy named Dr. Richard Easton that I believe God gifted to be able to solve these kind of things. I woke up out of surgery. I've never had one pain since that second five years ago. I mean, I can do whatever I want. It's awesome. I mean, Ann was there. It's just amazing. So did God heal my back? Yeah. Could he have done it through a touch? If he wanted to. But he did it through a surgeon. God bless the surgeon. I hope someday he comes to our church. You know, he's, I, I did that pastor's back. Yeah, he goes, it was really bad in there. He told Aunt all the, the bone spurs he chopped off, like eight of them, it's unbelievable. And, and people say, well, God didn't heal you. Yes, he did. He healed me through a doctor. It's, the doctor didn't heal me. God healed me through the, 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 the marvel of modern medicine. What a gift, right? So I say, he heals all our diseases. And Sister Barb, mother of four sons, Gets lung cancer. How many years ago? 1999. Woman of God begs God to heal her and not take her life. Every day, Anne was laying beside her when she died. Guess what? Jesus healed Barb's disease in heaven. She is right now looking at the face of the Father. 
Did he heal her in our physical world? Nope. And I don't know why. And nobody does. But does God heal all diseases? Yep. Sometimes it's here. Sometimes with the touch. Sometimes with a word. Often with medicine and doctors. Sometimes it's when we meet him face to face. So when David writes this, is he writing the truth? Yeah. But you can't take this out of context and say, that means whatever disease you have, you just go to church to a healer, you'll get healed. He may. And I would encourage you, try. Why not? Why not go every time and ask somebody to believe God? And by the way, last thing I'll say. If you don't get healed by somebody that lays their hands on you and pray, it is not your fault. Do not let anybody say you didn't have enough faith. That is just not anywhere in Scripture. If you just have more faith, you get healed. That's not in Scripture. God chooses to heal who and when according to his will and his time. It's up to him, not us. But we go ask, and we plead, and we beg, and we ask God, and he'll heal one way or another, either now, later, or through medicine. All right, let's keep going. Are we okay? We're doing good? Okay, number three. Oh, my gosh. I got seven seconds. All right. Number three, benefit number three is God saves us. We are saved. It says, who redeems your life from the pit. He saves us from hell. He saves us from despair. You know, it's interesting. I thought of this. Um, Basically, he's saying he saves you from a destructive life. God saves you from the pit. Ann and I were asked Sunday night to come speak to our high school students at Edge. Guess about what topic. Guess what topic they gave us. Would you come in and talk about sex? Like, okay, thanks. You guys don't want to talk about it, we'll talk about it. And they said most of it will just be Q&A. (laughs) Q&A? They literally said, you have 15 minutes to tell your story, 45 minutes of questions. 45 minutes? High school kids just going at us, you know? So we went in there and told our story. And here's what you need to know about our story. If God hadn't have saved Ann and me, and I can really just talk for me, from my sexual disobedience in high school and college, because I disobeyed his moral law. We talked about it a couple weeks ago on a weekend. I would right now be in the pit. I can just tell you that. I know where I was headed. I know who I was going to marry. And it was all in disobedience to God, and I could have done that if I wanted to. And I'm just going to tell you, if I would have made those choices, God would have had to dig way down in that pit to pull me out. Because I wouldn't be standing here today as a pastor. I would not be married, probably be divorced, probably have carnage in my legacy. And that was the pit I was heading to. You know why I'm standing here today? Because God rescued me from the pit, just like he did David. And he will rescue anyone who just sticks their hand up. All you got to do is just say, God, that's all. You don't have to crawl out of that pit. You just stick your hand up and say, God, I can't get out of this pit. Will you grab me? And he'll grab you. And he'll pull you out of the pit. It says right here, he redeems your life from the pit. Benefit number four, he gives hope. Look at this, it says, who satisfies you with good so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. The Lord works righteousness and justice for all who are oppressed. Literally, it says, he satisfies our desires with good things. What's he do? He basically says, don't chase after stuff on earth. I will satisfy your desire with what? Good things from me. That gives us hope to go on. Then the last one is this, and I know I'm flying. The last one is benefit is, is uh, we are loved. We are loved. I gotta just I gotta read verse 8 through 12. We just read it. But it says, the Lord is merciful and gracious. Look at this, slow to anger and abounding in, in steadfast love. He will not always chide, nor will he keep his anger forever. You know what the word chide means? It's sort of an old English word. It means scold or punish. It's a beautiful thing that David wrote. He will not scold or punish you. Look what it says. He will not chide, he will not keep his anger forever. He does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his steadfast love toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. This is such a beautiful passage. I would encourage you to commit this to memory. You need to know this. This is the reckless love of God. You don't deserve, we don't deserve this mercy, and he gives us mercy. Many of us have this wrong view of God. I even grew up with this, is is you sort of see God chasing you. It's like, God's after me. God's chasing me. And here's what I'd say. God is chasing you. And we think he's chasing us to chide us, to scold us, and punish us. That's not why God's chasing you. If you could look back as you're running away because you're afraid of him and you see his face, you would see his face would have concern and love all over. It's like you're running into a street, you're going to get hit by cars. I'm chasing you to save you because I love you. 
See, we think he's chasing us to punish us, and he would say to us, I'm not punishing you. I punished my son for you. I chased down my son. I put your sin on him. He's on, it's on that cross, but you, I chased and embraced. Do you understand that? That's what it means. He takes our sins, and he separates them from the east or the west. There's no, he can't, go. he never remembers them. They're done. They're gone. I think the one thing, if anything, God wants to walk out of here is his reckless love is so great for you. You are pure in Christ. Do not walk out of here feeling like I'm a, I'm a dead sinner. Yes, you and I are sinners, but we are renewed by the blood of Jesus. And he says, your sin is forgiven. You are healed. You are saved. You are redeemed from the pit, and you are loved. Oh my gosh, you are loved. I got to close with this. Max Lucado, when you think of God's love, you got to go to Max Lucado. He always writes so well about it. Listen to this. He says, God will not let you go. Some of you might need to know that. He's not going to let you go. He's going to hold on to you no matter what. The big news of the Bible is not that you love God, but that God loves you. He tattooed your name on the palm of his hand. His thoughts of you outnumber the sand on the shore. You never leave his mind, escape his sight, or flee his thoughts. You need not win his love. You already have it. He sees the worst of you and loves you still. Your sins of tomorrow and failings of the future will not surprise him. He sees them now. Every day and every day and deed of your life has passed before his eyes and has been calculated in his decision. He knows you better than you know you and has reached his verdict. He loves you still. No discovery will disillusion him. No rebellion will dissuade him. He loves you with an everlasting love. And listen to this. If God had a refrigerator, your picture would be on it. So well said. If he had a wallet, your photo would be in it. He sends you flowers every spring. He sends you a sunrise every morning. Whenever you want to talk, he will listen. He can live anywhere in the universe, yet he chooses your heart. Face it, friend. He's crazy about you. I was listening to uh, one of my favorite preachers, Francis Chan. He has a church now in San Francisco. And just recently, he uh, was preaching a sermon, and the day before, he did a wedding right there at the front of the stage, and he said, he said it was the greatest wedding he's ever been a part of. He said he married an older woman in their, in their, in their church who had never been married. And um, she couldn't believe that she found love. She has a 28-year-old daughter named April who is mentally disabled. She has the mental capacity of a six-year-old. And this woman, Jean, fell in love with this guy, Rick. And they came to Francis and they did a little counseling. He said every time they came to counseling, Jean would say, I can't believe you love me to Rick. Why do you love me? I'm old. I have, a, I have a daughter you're going to take on. And he would look at her because she would say, I'm so wrinkled, I'm old. And he says, your wrinkles are just dimples. And Francis said, I just watched this love. And he said, then at the day of the wedding, he goes, he goes you know, they, they were standing right here at the front of the stage. And, you know, we went through the whole thing. And, you know, the flower girl was her 28-year-old daughter, April. And she was standing right there. And, you know, he gives the ring to uh, Jean and then Rick, the, the, the groom, again, late 50s pulls out another ring. He says, April, I've got a ring for you too because I want you to know I'm taking you as well. And, oh, Francis tells us so well. He says, she just runs up on the stage, starts screaming, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, oh my gosh. So excited. I love you, I love you, I love you, I love you. Thank you. He said, everybody in the place is bawling their eyes out. It's just the most beautiful thing you'd ever seen because this guy surprised his new daughter who's a six-year-old thinking-wise, and that's how a six-year-old responds. And Francis said, oh, my gosh, do you know what we just witnessed? We just witnessed what this book, the Bible, is all about. See, the Bible says... His love for us is like a groom, and you and I are his bride. And we feel we're not worthy. We're too this or too sinful. He says, oh, you don't understand. I love you. And the Bible also says God is like our father who is a father to the fatherless. That's you and I. And so he says to you, oh, my gosh, my love is overwhelming, never-ending, reckless, What do we do with that? We receive it. Stop 
pushing it away and saying, I'm not worthy. You are worthy because Jesus said you're worthy. And receive it tonight. As we sing, just receive it. And what will it do? It will transform you, and then it'll send us out of here on mission to take that love to the world. The world does not understand this love. And you and I get to soak in a little bit tonight to receive it, but not just to stay there, then to allow it to transform us from inside out that we believe we are worthy. We believe we are a son or daughter of the king. And then we go and take that to somebody else who when they finally understand it will go, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. I love you, I love you, I love you. Because that's what God's saying to you tonight. I love you with an everlasting love. And so I'm going to invite you <laughs> to worship in a beautiful way. And again, some of you need to sit and maybe put your hands like this and say, God, I am struggling to believe that your love is that reckless for me. Just receive it. Some of you need to stand. Some of you will stand with your arms high and just bask in it. Just respond in an extravagant way to the radical, reckless love of God. And let God meet you right where you are because he is right here to meet you and then send you to the world. God, let us receive your love. In Jesus' name, amen. sit down and when you rise up I'm familiar with all your ways even the very hairs on your head are numbered for you were made in my image 
In me you live and move and have your being. For you are my offspring. I knew you even before you were conceived. I chose you when I planned creation. You were not a mistake. For all your days are written in my book. I determined the exact time of your birth and where you would live. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. I knit you together in your mother's womb and brought you forth on the day you were born. I've been misrepresented by those who don't know me. I'm not distant and angry, but I'm the complete expression of love. And it is my desire to lavish my love on you simply because you are my child and I am your father. I offer you more than your earthly father ever could for I am the perfect father. Every good gift that you receive comes from my hand for I am your provider and I meet all your needs. My plan for your future has always been filled with hope because I love you with an everlasting love. My thoughts toward you are countless as the sand on the seashore and I rejoice over you with singing. I will never stop doing good to you for you are my treasured possession. You're my treasured possession. I desire to establish you with all my heart and all my soul and I want to show you great and marvelous things. If you seek me with all your heart, you will find me. Delight in me and I will give you the desires of your heart for it is I gave you those desires for I'm able to do more than you could possibly ask or imagine for I'm your greatest encourager. I'm also the Father who loves you and comforts you in all your troubles. When you're broken hearted, I'm close to you and as a shepherd carries a lamb, I've carried you close to my heart. When I will, one day I will wipe away every tear from your eyes and I'll take away the pain that you've suffered on this earth. All the pain. I'm your Father and I love you even as I love my son Jesus. For in Jesus, my love for you is revealed. He's the exact representation of my being and he came to demonstrate that I am for you, not against you. And to tell you that I'm not counting your sins. Jesus died so that you and I could be reconciled. His death was the ultimate expression of my love for you. If you receive the gift of my son Jesus, you receive me. And nothing will ever separate you from my love again. Come home and I'll throw the biggest party that heaven has ever seen. I've always been father and will always be father. My question is, will you be my child? I'm waiting for you. Love your God, your father. Sing it out.
forget it. And also, Lord Jesus, may we go out and show other people the reckless love you have for them. May it not just stay in these walls, but may your gospel break out because of the worship that we experience, Jesus. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. Hey, thanks for coming tonight. Don't forget this weekend, uh, we actually have our K-Rock program, which is going to be pretty epic. Uh, We're glad that you guys are here with us tonight. Drive safe, right?